One of the things that Nate said that, that really struck me was when he pointed out that we have at least 29 unbaptized children that, that um, usually uh, are in attendance here. And they are our number one evangelistic opportunity and responsibility. These precious souls are, are in our hands. Of course, first of all, they're in their parents' hands, but also their grandparents, as well as the, the leaders of the congregation, as well as every member here who has any influence over them. And I hope we were, again, all inspired to do what we can in the precious short time uh, that we have uh, an influence over these children when they're most persuadable. And so parents, I hope you'll be making plans now how you can improve your Bible reading and teaching with your children, how you can make their spiritual growth and their spiritual welfare a priority. And uh, we're going to be working on some ideas for some possible tools and plans to help with that, which we hope to share soon. But this morning for our study, I want to kind of spin off of that idea by looking at what can happen if we don't make our children and their spiritual growth a priority. And I admit, uh, I almost hate to, to do that because, as I said, Nate's lesson was so inspiring. And in contrast, this lesson may be a bit of a, a downer. I hope you won't see it that way, though. I hope that you'll see it as an evidence or as evidence of why taking the responsibility to train our children seriously is so important. Last Sunday evening, if you were here, we studied a, a lesson from the minor prophet Amos. And our text this morning uh, is from another minor, minor prophet, that of Malachi. As I mentioned last week, minor just simply means that, that those books are shorter than some of the longer books of prophecy, which in turn are, are called major prophets. But Malachi, which is a, a rather short book, and so it's known as a minor prophet, Malachi is actually the last Old Testament prophet. In fact, it's the last book of the Old Testament. After God spoke to his people through the prophet Malachi, God fell silent for 400 years. No prophecy, no direct revelation, no communication from God to man. And so I think it stands to reason that what God had to say through Malachi must have been important, and it's worth our consideration. The setting of the book of Malachi is uh, at least one generation, if not two, after their return of the first Jewish exiles from captivity. You remember that under the persuasion of, of Ezra, the people of God began to rebuild uh, Jerusalem, and they met with some resistance and some discouragement, and uh, work on the temple even ceased for a while, or at least on the wall. Uh, but eventually, with further encouragement from Nehemiah, the work was completed somewhere around 520 B.C., and acceptable worship was restored. The zeal and the focus of those involved in this restoration, to me, represents one of the most faithful times in the history of, of God's people. Unfortunately, though, that passion and that faithfulness apparently did not pass on to their children and grandchildren. The following generation or generations became indifferent to the worship of God. There were many problems that crept into their lives that caused them to doubt God and doubt His love. And so Malachi comes with a strong message designed to wake them up. Well, I hope you can see the, the direct parallel to our world today. In the past, the church and its dedication to the truth have experienced uh, periods of restoration similar to those that we just described of, of Israel. We're all probably familiar with the restoration movement when uh, men dedicated themselves to speaking where the Bible speaks and being silent where the Bible is silent. Perhaps you've heard of stories of, of days gone by when gospel meetings would go on, not just for a weekend, but for weeks with multiple conversions. Over time, though, our society has changed. And in our generation, we rarely see that kind of numeric growth in the church. On the bright side, however, apart from numbers, I do think that our generation, in particular, particularly our congregation, has experienced positive spiritual growth in other areas over the, the past several years. In my view, the church is experiencing a time of, of unprecedented peace, for example. There has been greater emphasis, I think, placed on Bible study, not just for preachers, but for all Christians, both men and women. 
Churches all over the brotherhood are striving to follow God's design for scriptural leadership. And I hope and trust that groundwork has been laid that can be built on for generations to come. But you know, that's probably what the people of Ezra and Nehemiah's day thought as well. Imagine after spending those terrible years in captivity in a foreign land, they'd finally return to their homeland, the promised land. And their beloved Jerusalem had been rebuilt. And more importantly, God's temple had been restored. Granted, not to its former glory from the days of Solomon, but, but still, it was something that they could be proud of and that God approved of. Proper worship had been restored. The people of God had rediscovered, so to speak, the law of God, and they were once again following it. And the future looked bright. But as we said, within just one or two generations, all that progress, it seemed, was lost or was about to be lost. And so the goal of our study today is to see if we can see what went wrong. How did that next generation or those next generations lose their way and, and forget the hard lessons that had been learned from their past? Can we look at ourselves and see that the church today has lost ground from past generations? And what about the next generation? Even while we may see spiritual growth and we may see potential, will we do all that we can to ensure that our children and our grandchildren continue that progress and remain faithful and focused. And so let's notice some of the sins of the next generation in Malachi's day, as outlined here by, by the prophet. And as we do, let's try to make application to the church today. Well, first of all, we see that this next generation doubted God's love. This may have begun with seeds of doubt, just in the minds of some, but, but never really voiced out loud to, to others. But eventually, evidently, they questioned God's love publicly. Notice the first part of, of Malachi 1 verse 2 here. Uh, it says, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Now, that may seem like a rather shocking statement. How could God's people honestly question His love? After all, John plainly says in 1 John 4, verses 8, and again in verse 16, God is love. It's what the old song says. We uh, sang it this morning, and I did not prompt uh, Nate to lead that song, but I'm glad he did. But the song says, come, let us all unite to sing. God is love. And so it's hard to know how God's people could doubt that he loves us. We don't know for sure what prompted Malachi's generation to, to doubt God's love. Maybe it was some affliction or, or physical hardship. Maybe it was just indifference on their part. But God goes on in verses 2 through 5 to, to certainly reaffirm His love for Israel. And that's what we must do uh, as well to and for our children. We must reiterate God's love and, and care for us so that the next generation sees and believes that God is in control and that He always has our best spiritual and eternal interests in mind. Sadly, today, it's not uncommon for some to question God's even existence, let alone His love. And that's especially dangerous if uh, someone's faith is, is not a biblical faith, a faith uh, that requires a, a conviction in the existence of God, not God's or not Mother Nature or fate, as we sometimes hear those phrases tossed around, but a conviction in, again, the existence and the love of God. The writer of Hebrews uh, made this very plain. In Hebrews 11 and verse 1, he said, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Notice those words there that show us the certainty, assurance, conviction. And he goes on in verse 6 to say, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Our children need to be constantly reminded about God. They need to be shown God's hand in everything around us. The plants and the animals and the weather and the sun and the moon and the stars. They need to know that God created them and that God created them, our children, and that He loves them and that He wants what's best for them. They need to know about Jesus and what He did to save us. But you know, then again, we as adults need that reminder too. 
Because too often we get caught up in the, the cares and the troubles of this life and, and maybe we forget that God loves us and that He has promised to care for us if we will put our trust in Him. That trust, that faith, of course, uh, leads us to obedience according to Romans 1 verse 5. And it's in keeping of God's commandments that we experience His love. Jesus said in John 14 and 23, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Without faith, the next generation will never know, will never experience the love of God. Secondly, though, this next generation of, of Malachi's day, they came to not only doubt God and his love, but I guess the next logical effect was they began to dishonor his name. Notice Malachi 1 and verse 6. It says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, How have we despised your name? Once again, these accusations may sound rather shocking to us. How could uh, God's people, much less his priests, despise his name. Other versions say show contempt for or make light of or insult or disrespect my name. To despise God's name, that, that doesn't sound like an attitude that we would expect from a people that were only one or two generations removed, as we said, from the days of Ezra and, and Nehemiah. I meant to say this earlier, but if, if you go back and, and read those books, Ezra and Nehemiah, you see a people that was determined to please God. Maybe you remember the story of the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem. To me, that, that seems like the epitome of faith. Uh, we're told that the, the workers had uh, one hand busy at work with their tools, I suppose, and a weapon in the other hand to fight off those that were trying to oppose them. Imagine whatever your job is if you had to work with one hand and, and fight off people with another. Well, again, that shows faith. Um, there's another scene in uh, Nehemiah 8 and verse 9 where the people wept, cried aloud as they heard Ezra read the words of the law and they realized that they had failed or had been failing to keep it. Again, this, this kind of faith, but now they were insulting God? How, how could that be? Well, Malachi goes on to describe to them how they had dishonored God. If not in their words, then certainly in their actions. By the way, I think that goes to show that, that our actions often reveal our, our subconscious attitudes. Um, people can't read our mind necessarily, but certain our actions bring those attitudes to the surface. Malachi says that they had dishonored God through their blemished sacrifices. He says in verses 7 through 10 that they had offered polluted food on his altar, specifically blind and, and lame and, and sick animals. And obviously that was strictly forbidden in the law of Moses. They were supposed to offer, offer, only offer their best, but, but they weren't. God says, if, if you presented such pitiful offerings as this to your governor, would he accept them? Obviously the answer to that is no. They offered to God what they would be embarrassed to offer to men. In fact, God goes so far as to wish that someone would shut the doors to prevent more of their vain worship. Furthermore, God provides some more evidence of, of how they had profaned his name. In verses 12 through 14, he points out their half-hearted worship. He quotes them as saying, what a weariness this is. They had made worship nothing more than just a ritual. Their heart certainly was not in it. In fact, he even says at one point that they snort at it. Other versions say that they turned up their nose or they viewed it as trivial. That was their attitude toward the worship of God. Well, once again, I think we can draw some, some telling comparisons to our world today, not only in worship, but also in the sacrifices of our everyday lives. Malachi proves that it makes a difference how and why we worship God. Our worship must be pleasing to God, must be in truth, but it also must be in spirit, or else it's vain. And we might as well shut the doors, as Malachi says. The religious world seems to have lost sight of that fact. They offer God worship that was never designed, never approved, that's not according to truth. 
But denominations aren't the only ones who are, are guilty. Sometimes I'm afraid we do not worship in spirit. Our minds, our hearts are not in it. It's just um, trivial. It's just ritual. Do we dishonor God by offering less than our best? Remember, he gave the, the very best of heaven. He gave his perfect son. 1 Peter 1 and 19 describes him as a lamb without blemish or spot. We see that, again, reference to a perfect sacrifice. And so how can we offer a defiled offering in return? When we try to get away with the bare minimum, just giving God our leftovers, what costs the least in time, the least in money, the least in effort, when we, we, when we view worship or, or any sacrifice as a weariness or a ritual, just going through the motions, when our praise of God pales in comparison to our praise of maybe a, a favorite sports team or a political figure, certainly God will, will not be pleased. And all of this is important not only for our own spiritual health, but certainly it's important for the future of our children. Because believe me, they are watching and they're learning from our example. Our attitudes, our efforts, our sacrifices most likely will be duplicated by them. The spiritual pulse of the next generation rests largely on our shoulders. So we need to show them how important God's word and his worship and his church are to us if we expect these things to be important to them. Moving on to, to chapter 2 of, of Malachi, we find that the next generation of, of Malachi's day had further displeased God by desecrating his covenant. In verses 1 through 9, Malachi specifically warns the priests who had corrupted the covenant of Levi. Levi, of course, was, was the mentor, if you will, of the priests. And um, God had a special relationship with them, but, but they had... Um, broken that covenant or corrupted that covenant. Instead of guarding knowledge and, and serving as faithful messengers, it says that they had turned aside from the way and they had caused many to, to stumble by their instructions. And of course, today we don't have priests, at least not in the Old Testament sense. In fact, under the New Testament, all Christians are priests, according to 1 Peter 2. And so in that sense, we are all to be messengers who know the truth, who obey it, and who teach it to others. And certainly this responsibility is nowhere better demonstrated than our, in our role of teaching our children, teaching them so that they may become the next generation of priests. Besides the priests, though, Malachi further rebukes his generation for profaning God's covenant of marriage. In verses 10 through 12, he says that an abomination has been committed in their marriage to the daughter of a foreign god. And most commentators agree that this likely refers to them marrying uh, foreign pagan women. That, again, had been strictly forbidden by God. Uh, this issue had been addressed and supposedly fixed or repented of previously with their fathers and uh, grandfathers in Ezra chapters 9 and 10 and Nehemiah chapter 13. You go back and read how, uh, in fact, that was one of the parts where Ezra read the law and they wept because they realized that they were guilty. And as I said, apparently they had repented and, and fixed this problem. But this next generation had backslidden. Mac Malachi prays in verse 12 that the Lord would cut off from Jacob those who did this. And I can't say that there's a, a binding application to New Testament, New Testament Christians here necessarily, but I certainly do think it could be a warning of, of the dangers of marrying an unbeliever, particularly when it comes to the influence that they have on our children. But Malachi goes on to point out yet another way in which his generation had desecrated God's covenant of marriage, and that is through their treacherous, as he calls it, divorces. He says in verse 14, because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. King James Version says that they had dealt treacherously with their wives. And, and these aren't their foreign wives, by the way. These are their um, approved, if you will, their Jewish wives. And he clarifies his position in verse 16. He says, For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence. 
there are several versions that, that translate the, pers- the first part of that verse. For I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel, for it covers one's garment with violence. Either way, whether it's speaking of a man not loving or hating his wife, um, figuratively speaking, by divorcing her, or whether he's saying that God hates divorce, obviously I think the, the point is clear here. And Jesus, of course, uh, perpetuated this teaching in Matthew, the 19th chapter. He pointed out that marriage is intended to be for life. He said, "What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And he went on to explain that God permitted divorce in Moses' day because of their hardness of heart. But he says, from the beginning, it was not so. There in Matthew 19, Jesus, I do believe, allowed for divorce and remarriage but for one cause only, adultery or fornication. And to put it clearly, divorce represents a failure on one or both mates to keep the vows that they made before God and man. It destroys what God has joined together. It destroys a home. It often destroys the lives of children. That's why God hates divorce. Well, apparently Malachi's generation had failed to follow God's plan, And how can we say that our generation has not been as guilty, if not more so, when we consider the divorce rate in our society today? And so how do we reverse that trend? How do we ensure that the next generation doesn't continue to plummet further? Well, by teaching and by showing our children, the next generation, what it means to treasure the covenant, the bonds of marriage. By the way, that's the marriage covenant that God created between one man and one woman. I think we all agree with that. By unselfishly loving and honoring our spouses, as the New Testament teaches in Ephesians 5, among other passages, fathers and other Christian men who have an influence must show young men, young boys, how to be good husbands. And mothers and other Christian women must show girls how to be good wives. Not only that, but boys will also learn from godly women and girls will learn from godly men how to choose a mate who believes in and lives by God's pattern for the home. Children, again, learn by our example. And so the change begins with us. Well, the next sin of of Malachi's generation that God points out through his prophet is that they had tried his patience, wearying him with their words. And the example that he gives is a very serious one. He says that they had disparaged God's justice. They said, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. That sounds like a a bit of whining. In fact, it reminds me of Jonah uh, whining about the people of of Nineveh when they repented. But, But God goes on to accuse them of asking. He said that they had asked, where is the God of justice. They questioned God's justice. And I don't think that's anything short of of blasphemy and and mockery uh, when it comes to God's fairness and, and justice. That's a direct challenge to God's character. They blamed their problems on God and they accused him of favoring evildoers. Well, in chapter three, God's response was to send his messenger or messengers. First, a messenger who would prepare the way. I believe that this was fulfilled, this prophecy was fulfilled by John the Baptist who came to announce the coming of the Messiah. And then God says the messenger of the covenant would come. And that, uh, of course, seems to be Jesus, the Messiah, who would apply the judgment of God fairly and justly and would separate those who are pure and faithful. They had questioned, where is the God of justice? And the Lord answers that he would draw near to them for judgment. How much nearer could he come than, than coming in the flesh in the form of a man, God's son? And so what about us? Are we guilty of belittling God's patience and questioning his, his justice? Do we sometimes think, where is God? The scoffers in in Peter's day said, where is the promise of his coming? 2 Peter 3 and verse 4. We may not say those words out loud, but as we said, very often our actions show our heart and our attitudes. And so do our lives reflect the fact that we wonder, is Jesus 
coming back. Peter went on to write in verse 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But we can try God's patience if we continue in sin, or if we think lightly of sin. And if our children see us testing God's patience, if they see us continuing to do things that we know and that they know, we shouldn't. Or if they see us failing to do things that we know and that they know, again, they know a lot more than we think, failing to do things that they know we should, will they learn any differently than to scoff at God and His judgment? Instead, we should live our lives and we should give our children the example um, as if we expect Jesus to return at any moment. As Peter says in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. We're not promised a tomorrow. And so let us live that way and let us show our children how to live that way to always be prepared. Next in our text, <clears throat> Malachi rebukes his generation for deserting God's ordinances, from turning aside from his law and his statutes. And when they ask him for an example, he uses their tithes or their lack thereof as a case in point. They had robbed God by their failure to offer their tithes. And for this reason, the whole nation had been accursed. They were challenged to bring their tithes and to see the blessings that would follow. Well, are we guilty of deserting or forsaking God's ordinances uh, for the church? Certainly the world has done so with, with many of these statutes, such as baptism for the remission of sins or partaking of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week in memory of His death. The world has... has um, either changed or done away with those ordinances, but are we guilty of, of deserting these or other commandments of our Lord, such as the command not to forsake assembly, or to lay by in store as we prosper, or to dress modestly, or to keep our minds pure, or to control our tongue, or on and on we could go. But the point is, we must not take God's commands lightly. And as we've stated, we must not allow our children to see us ignoring God's ordinances because they learn from our example. Now, that's not to say that, that we're expected to be perfect as parents. In fact, I would go so far as to say that even if we could be perfect, which we can't, but even if we could, that wouldn't necessarily be the best learning experience for our children. Because if we never made a mistake, then when they make mistakes, because they will, then maybe they will feel like they would feel like they were failures. Well, as I said, we don't really have to worry about that because we're not going to be perfect. But when we do fail as parents, and we, and we will, we should teach our children how to confess our faults, how to repent of them, how to do better each day. And that's not just lip service. That's not just saying we're sorry, but, but never doing anything to change it. We must genuinely correct our wrongs. That's the example that our children need to learn from. Well, lastly, in, in our text, in Malachi Chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, we find one more sin that the people of, of his generation were guilty of, and that is that they despised God's service. That is, they claimed that serving God was vain. God says that their words were, were harsh against him. Again, I think, I think that shows an attitude of, of disrespect, certainly an added, a lack of humility. But they questioned what profit there was in keeping his ordinances. It appeared to them, as we had said earlier, that, that evildoers were prospering. And so what good did it do to, to follow and obey God? Well, these accusations had already been answered by God. It was their lack of faithfulness, their robbery of God, that had caused their lack of blessings. When we serve God faithfully, it is never in vain. We will either reap rewards here in this life, or most importantly, we will reap them in eternity. And that's a lesson that we must desperately teach our children. Not that this life will be easy, because we're not promised that, but teach them to have an eternal perspective. Teach them that there is a reward. Maybe we don't realize it here in this life, but there is a reward that's much more important, one that will last through eternity. We must show them by the way that we prioritize things in our life, what's most important, to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, according to Matthew 6 and 33. Well, in closing, despite the, the failures of, of Malachi's generation, 
toward the end of chapter 3, there is hope. Those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, it seems, and the Lord took note. It says that a book of remembrance was written. This seems to, to symbolize the idea that God would remember their faith and their life and their works, even though they may have been few in number. And what a comfort this must have been to those who were, who were faithful during this time, uh, this time where there was so much backsliding and corruption. These faithful ones, God says, would be part of his treasured possession. And it would be easy to discern between the righteous and the wicked by their service to God. Well, I don't know if this book of remembrance was a literal book or not, but to me it's very reminiscent of what's called the book of life in several New Testament passages such as Philippians 4 and verse 3, Revelation 3 and verse 5, Revelation 20 and verse 12. And we find there in Revelation especially that those, who name, <clears throat> those whose names are not found written in this book of life tragically will be cast into the lake of fire, according to <clears throat> Revelation 20 and verse 15. And so we want our name to be found in that book. And we want the names of our children and our grandchildren to be found in that book. We want the names of generations after them <clears throat> to be found in that book. And so... We must do all we can, as we said, in the short time that we have to make that our goal. 